Greetings, and welcome to episode five of the Owlings Podcast Project. My name is Marty Wilsey, and tonight it's happy hour. We're all drinking. Um, should be fun. Um, it's it's not coffee. Just saying. <laughs> anyway, uh, this week we're uh, going to start out by uh, all the authors here. Um, instead of giving our same old same old author intro. We're going to say something interesting about our own selves as we go around. I'll get it started. Tomorrow, I am uh, starting guitar lessons. This is part of the effort I have. I'm calling it Teaching Old Dog New Tricks. I am uh, um, doing that, and my wife's very excited because one of the old dog new tricks things, when I empty the dishwasher, I actually sort the silverware as I dump it in the thing. My wife loves that. I, I found a small thing that my wife loved me for. So that's it. Don't worry about you, man. Starting to worry. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to go, go around. Just jump in. Whoever wants to go next. All right, guys. Well, I'm Jeffrey. Hello again. The time horse. Voila. And one thing I can say, en français, si je veux, mais I will say this. I have indeed flown a plane before. Now you know, and although I did not get my pilot's license, I hope to someday, maybe when I retire. There should be a story there. <laughs> I, should tell, I should tell you, Jeffrey. Yeah? I did get my pilot's license. Sweet. And it expired. And one of the things I'd like to do in, in sometime in the near future is uh, get my pilot's license renewed. Because that was big fun, flying small oh, yeah. planes. Expensive, though, uh, right? You know, got my pilot's license when I was 18 years old. Ooh. And uh, I had a lot of fun doing that. And uh, I, a lot of my college buddies got their pilot's license at the same time. Oh, mm. the shenanigans we did back in the day. <laughs> it was uh, a lot of fun. And uh, I kind of regret the whole thing expiring. That's, that's really fun stuff. It's very expensive, though, isn't it, Marty? I take keep it up? Uh, yeah, kind of. Um, there's a lot of ways to, uh, to do it. Uh, for a while, I was helping uh, my instructor deliver planes. You know, sure. rich guys that buy planes. Yeah. And what, what we do is my instructor, who was rated on like everything, um, he'd fly the plane there and I'd follow him in a Cessna 150 <laughs> and uh, fly him back. And it was, I got a lot of flight time that way. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, it was a lot of fun, of too. Got to go places I wouldn't normally gotten to go. That is very cool. Uh, but hey, Marty, what are you drinking? Because I'm drinking a uh, caffeine free Diet Coke, which you can't well, see. Well, tonight it's Buffalo Trace bourbon. Mm. One of my favorites. It's a staple item around here. Um, my wife was suspicious because she knows I don't drink coffee in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drinking an Italian brandy called Di Serrano. Um, it's pretty good. It's got an almondy taste. And I finally have won the argument of making this podcast not sober. I mean, I've been trying and I've been weeding the way. I have been set, weeding by example for five episodes and finally uh, I got it. So I am S.D. McGowey and my fun fact is that I have met the Pope. And it turns out that when you are in a wheelchair, it is very easy to meet the Pope. So if you would like to meet the Pope, um, take me to Italy and I will help you. And uh, I would love to meet him again because he is wonderful. But uh, I was just shepherded into this back room immediately without even asking. Just a Swiss guard just said, come, come. And I said, no, you know, I want to meet the Pope. And he said, oh, no, the Pope come to you. Uh, oh. It's it's a great thing. So yeah, yeah. Well, yes. a beautiful country, beautiful people, and uh, great uh, leader of the church, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, that's my fun fact. Yeah, I'd love to go to Rome. You know, one in my travel list. That's one of the uh, the biggies. I'm just saying, you know, Paolo <laughs> Italiano. I may take you up on that, my friend. Good, do it. <laughs> All right, my, my name is David Keener. I want to welcome you to the Tuesday Night Society for the Prevention of Sobriety, <laughs> otherwise known as the Our Wings Podcast Project. Um, my beverage of choice tonight is the Northern Lights IPA, if I can hmm. 
if the camera will actually show that, <laughs> the Northern Lights uh, IPA from uh, Star Hill Brewery. And fun fact about me, other than that, I'm drinking beer during the podcast, um, which is unusual for me. Uh, I, or I have been the big dog handler for a couple of different uh, animal, animal rescue leagues. Uh, and in fact, uh, the reason why I uh, don't currently belong to an animal rescue league is because I tend to adopt the large dogs <laughs> and my wife won't let me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was actually considering being sneaky and uh, uh, getting a rescue uh, for Brenda for Christmas. And the shelters here are like, like empty. It's, uh, good. it's really, good. really great. That's good. A, a rescue cat or dog? Dog. <clears throat> she, uh, she has been wanting to get like a, a golden retriever. And um, she is cool with getting an elderly golden retriever, mm -hmm. which are much easier to rescue. Mm -hmm. And one popped up. I've been sneakily watching the websites for Fredericksburg SBCA mm -hmm. and stuff. And uh, an older eight-year-old uh, golden retriever came up. And, you know, I, I immediately emailed them. And I was like, you know, 800 in line. And, All right. Uh, it, was, it was nuts. I've, I've had a Goldie. When I was growing up, I had a Goldie. They're a wonderful breed. <laughs> yeah, so did Brenda. That was the size dog that she always had when she was growing up. All of my dogs have been rescues. Mm. Yeah, our dogs are rescue, too. Yeah, so are our cats. Um, that's all good. Um, and I can introduce myself now again. Um, my name is Erica Gravely, and tonight I'm I'm just drinking tea. But it's... Oh my God. It's cinnamon spice. Does that count? It's oh, a little wow. wild. It's, so it's really good tea. We should have. Uh, it's really good. We should have told you to lie in advance, and then we all. It's seen in my Ravenclaw cooler. mug. No. Wow. We, I, 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 we you drank all the alcohol in the house. There's, there's not much left. In all the rules tonight. Nice. And my, my interesting fact is that I, for the first time, uh, roasted a whole turkey by myself. For Thanksgiving. Nice. Congrats. Wow. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. I didn't yeah. burn any. How big was it? Uh, 13 pounds. Ooh. Respectable. Well, the supermarket well, we, I, I don't know what, what she was thinking, but my, uh, there was three of us this year for Thanksgiving and my wife got a 22 pound turkey. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just three people. To say, apparently, and, uh, uh, it's a small it's a big turkey. turkey. On, a, on a year when you have a lot of people over, it would be a big turkey. Yeah. Geez. But uh, there was three of us, and we had a 22-pound turkey, and we had five pies. I, That's I just a good person the, to pie ratio. Apparently, uh, the focus this year was actually on smaller turkeys because of smaller family groups. Uh -huh. yeah. the, the supermarkets have these huge, huge deals now on the 20 pound plus turkeys because they did not sell anywhere near as many of them as they thought they would. Yep, my mom bought one of them. Yeah, <laughs> I had to go said. and uh, score a couple of those for the freezer. That'd be good. Yep. Exactly. Okay, you must have like a deep freeze in the garage or something. Yes. yes okay, because I'm like, there's no way that I'd be able to, to fit a turkey in my freezer. Okay, wait, speaking of having a deep freeze, has anybody been like, I don't know, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna sound very crazy by asking this question. Has anyone been stocking up on like materials because of like what people have been saying about like, oh, you know, get your food, get your water now, get your toilet paper, second wave, all that stuff. Like, do you have any like very long-term food storages in your house? You know, if I could just say this, I mean, this is gonna sound weird, I know, but, uh, Around about the end of 19, uh, 2019, um, I uh, said, hmm, I like toilet, uh, you know, I want to get a big box of toilet paper. And uh, then I realized, oh, wait, I just got this big box of toilet paper. I haven't finished it yet. All right, so you're set. So if we run out, we're coming to your house. Uh, I guess so. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. What a great way to have company. <laughs> so it's interesting uh, to answer your question. Both myself and my wife Brenda, uh, we grew up in farm country in Western New York, and it's it was completely different shopping habits than in metro areas. I mean, right. 
we always had a pantry that was, you know, five months deep, six months deep. Um, you know, we don't go to the grocery store, you know, every other day, like uh, so many people yeah. I know do. Yeah. Um, so we always have a really deep pantry. We always had, you know, stuff uh, bought in bulk. I mean, we were cheap. You know, it's yeah. we have, it's funny. We had a big stockpile of toilet paper, not because we, uh, you know, were, Panicking. you know, yeah. uh, prescient about what was going to happen. We just would buy Costco toilet paper when it was on sale because yeah. we had places in the garage where we just, pile a couple of bales yeah and you use one bale and then you go buy another bale you just have yeah. this queue yeah. and you never have to worry about it i don't know a couple months ago i broke down and i did it and i just have been like so proud of myself ever since i bought two huge boxes from like the mormon church of like dried carrots and oatmeal that's going to last 20 years or something and then i got like an all-purpose crank radio that like doesn't need any batteries or anything and my parents like just looked at me and started laughing, but I was like, you know what? You're gonna thank me one day. I got everything. I'm gonna like stock up on gold. I'm gonna get it all. I'm gonna be like, a, uh, I'm gonna be with my little safe. Guns and ammo, man. Guns and ammo. Yes, absolutely. I'm not I'm a prepper. On it. I'm not a prepper, but a, um, you never. I, I never necessarily knew what was going to happen with the pandemic. So yes, I have a gun in the house, and. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, I have about 90 days worth of supplies in the house. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't felt the need to do more than that, but uh, you know, if things go south for, for a short period of time or something, yes, I feel like I'm pretty well ready. Right. Nice. And some people like refuse to answer that too. Like they want to, they want you to be surprised. Like, hey, maybe you'll see me, maybe you won't after the after Armageddon. Uh, my feeling is all the food's going to get eaten. It's just a matter of whether I eat it now yeah, or, or a month or two from now. But, uh, you know, so all I've really done is I've, I've um, bumped my, my marketing up a bit and I've got more supply on hand, but I don't feel like uh, I've gone to any ridiculous extremes. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling survivor, man. I'm feeling really proud. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty interesting on the top, on that topic, I um, have uh, read lots of fiction based on that. And in um, uh, one of the books I read, they talk about the rule of 10. Have you ever heard this? No, tell me. It is a measure on how prepared you are to survive uh, stuff. Oh, crap. You okay, know, I want to I wanna take this test. Can you, can you like, do it on me? Sure. All right, okay. let's do it. Uh, the first 10 is the power goes out for 10 seconds. Are you... Are you co cool? Yeah, I, mean, I got think Kindle about it. I mean, my computer has a UPS. I am good to go. I don't care if the power goes out. But what about for 10 minutes? Are you good for 10 minutes? And uh, so progressively, you, that number goes higher. And you can measure how prepared you are for um, things based on that. Uh, if the power is out for 10 days. Are you good? I mean, um, I would say that I'm good, except for my fish tank. My fish tank might be sacrificed. But yeah. other than that, I think I'd be so, all right. You know, things like, um, you know, I could use my automobile to keep my freezer cold, you know, so that the stuff doesn't thaw in my freezer. Plus, that'd be the first thing I ate. But right, right. then are you prepared? What happens if you lose power and stuff goes sideways for 10 weeks. Are you good for 10 weeks? The problem with that is after 10 days, all the food's gone in the grocery stores. Yeah. And unrest would likely start. And in 10 weeks, it's really gonna be ugly. Yeah, I've heard the average metropolitan area has food uh, in the stores and stuff for about two weeks. So 10 days is, is not a bad estimate. Yeah. So then just, if you, if if you measure it out to 10 weeks, it starts to get ugly. That's when, you know, most people, their pantries are empty then. It just reminds you, you of good. No, well, I was saying then you gotta be prepared for a lot of other stuff. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, the, in the book, One Second After, oh, yeah. I, I don't know if you've read this book. I have. Um, he had a daughter that was diabetic, for instance, mm -hmm. and 
the insulin ran out. Mm -hmm. And suddenly things that were, you know, a mild inconvenience suddenly were, you know, really bad. You know, people's heart medicine was gone. How's your prescriptions, you know? Uh, and it wasn't just his daughter, too. It was a lot of uh, anybody that was on serious medication um, was in trouble pretty quick. Right. And then they talked about the looting of the drug stores and stuff like that and the violence that would start happening. And that's when, you know, having a firearm handy would be really, you know, good. If, you, if you've got, you know, like I, I know a lot of people that are Mormons and they have a standard policy in uh, the Mormon church to have an entire year's worth of food on hand. Yep. And, and uh, it's just a policy all across the, uh, the entire um, Mormon faith. Well, really, I think smart. I that. <laughs> really smart. Really smart. I think and, I met uh, it. I, I ordered from them and they have a great selection. And uh, yeah, I think my two, I mean, we'll, we'll just be eating carrots and oats, but you know. Hey, it uh, <laughs> keeps you from, uh, from starving. Yeah. Make and, sure. Uh, and a lot of things that people don't water. Uh, water. I was wondering, like, do I need that? Like, could I? Well, filtering is what you need to worry about. I mean, as long as you can filter it. Okay. Because I do live near a stream. I have a pool. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, for the 10 month 10, a pool would be good. Yeah. Because uh, a pool yeah. water is actually potable. Um, yeah. You don't, you know, you don't want to start suddenly like, you, uh, drinking uh, stream water mm -hmm. and suddenly, you know, get diarrhea, which will kill you in yeah. uh, really yeah. harsh situations. But I mean, I, will, uh, I was just going to say, for years and years, I wanted to put solar panels on the house. So with an electric car and a, 70, a 72 kilowatt hour battery in my uh, garage there, that would be perfect. It wouldn't last me 10 months. <laughs> You know, but it, it would actually be a, a good way to at least bridge maybe a day or two of uh, no electricity. And indeed, yeah. I can cut myself off from the, uh, the Dominion, our power provider for most of Virginia, and just say, look, I'm doing my own power. I don't need you. And just be totally free and off that at least. That was a really <laughs> interesting thing about the program they have in the Old Dominion. Um, you can get solar panels for your house. The weird part is if the power goes out, you're still, the power is still out. Um, it's yeah. a whole different thing to have battery storage in, at your home. That's, that's a whole different thing than right. dumping power back onto the grid. You know, it's, that's, that's, that's the reason why you can't. You, that's why even if you've got solar panels, even if you've got the ups, you can't, uh, you, you, you'll get, you'll lose power because you're grid tied. And, and I, I certainly would prefer not to be grid tied. And in fact, when I, a few months ago, uh, I got an email from Tesla because I drive a Tesla and they said, hey, replace all of your roof with solar shingles. And I, yes, I'm touching my, my ceiling right now. Um, and I really wanted to do that. Yes, it would have been a big money waste, but they would have put four, four power walls in my basement. And, you know, I would have ups all throughout the night and solar all throughout well, the day. Here's the other interesting thing about all of that. Um, uh, one, you know, a lot of people have generators and they don't realize that gasoline goes bad in six months. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can, you can treat it and it'll last a year or two. Um, that's about it, yeah. But, you know, that's not so cool either. I actually you know. Uh, I, uh, I far prepare, I, you know, I uh, would prefer to, you know, set the place up so you don't need any power. Yeah, yeah that's true. A couple months ago, I, I, I emailed a, uh, a company, I think it was in Texas or something. I mean, of course it was in Texas. That does, um, it just does bunkers, like just mm. nuclear bunkers. And I was like, I want a bunker that like is underground because those are the only ones you can, that can defend you from nuclear bombs or whatever. And I said, but you know, I can't, I can't do a ladder. I can't do stairs. Like, you know, what can y'all right. do for me? And right. he's like, no, we can do like elevators. We can do like really long ramps that like twist around it. Mm -hmm. Like they had it all covered. And I was like, wow. all right. That is cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, yeah, that, that, when I move out, sure. My, I'm going to get myself a bunker in my backyard. Yeah. Into, I, I have a friend who uh, uh, actually built a house. It's a 
earth shelter. And it is a like a 90% bomb shelter, really. And wow. uh, he's got solar that powers the whole thing. He, uh, uh, you know, could heat his entire house just with firewood. It's a great topic for, for sci-fi authors, by the way. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, I've, I've written a couple of zombie apocalypse stories already, and I'd love to write an entire novel that was basically, you know, a survivalist story. It's just with the backdrop of zombies. Mm. Oh, you're welcome for bringing it up. You're welcome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, will, I feel like we should mention at this point that the, the, the novel was uh, One Second After by William Forstchen. Mm. For anybody who wants to actually check out the novel. Oh, yeah, please do. It's also followed by two sequels, which I liked, but I didn't think were quite as good as the first yeah, one. Yeah, I, re I read the sequels. I didn't like them as much. Um, mm. Another one in the same vein is The Last Babylon, which is one of my favorites. It was uh, uh, written during the Cold War, and it was details about surviving an atomic um, attack uh, after uh, uh, bombs fell and uh, a realistic depiction of what it was like in areas where there was not fallout and stuff. Yeah, Very interesting Last Babylon topic. by Pat Frank. Mm. Well, speaking yeah. of Apocalypse and Armageddon, um, our anthology is almost done. Oh, yeah. That's right. I am really, really hammering on that this week. I have been the nag master. Yes. Uh, for, Thanks uh, for taking over. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> for doing good for job, getting buddy. it done. Dang. How, many, how, many, how long has that been pending? Like, I, we, we blew through that deadline like it was nothing. The deadline oh. was like January 1st to get stories in. For, yeah. for 2020? Yeah. yeah, for 2019. Yeah. I can I neither confess or, or admit that uh, I may have blown that deadline very, very, very. Yeah, yeah. very, very Dave, bad. you will love to know that you were not the last one in. Oh, what? wow. <laughs> Which story are you not going to say? Are you going to be nice? Uh, I, I may not. I, I won't say because I didn't get permission to say. But All Dave, right. you were not last. That's Fair shocking. enough. I have one. Shocking. I am not last. The Arrowings yeah. are very talented, but we just, we don't understand deadlines. We look it up in the dictionary every time someone mentions it. Hey, for oh, no. the record, like I've made every deadline. I mean, I had a story in that awesome Forever House trilogy, uh, 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 anthology that Dave is working on there. I, we were told, get it in by the end of 2019. I did. I rushed it through writing groups just as fast as I could just to get it in there by the deadline. Well, I am proud of you. Good. I just want to say, I feel like that I'm following in, the, in, in great footsteps. I mean, Douglas Adams was the one who yeah. wrote the, yeah. I love deadlines. I really love the whooshing sound they make as they go by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another interesting thing about it is that it is uh, topping out at around 400 pages. And, um, you know, yeah. I can remember the point where we were worried whether we'd have enough content at all. And uh, even, you know, uh, with the line spacing at 1.08, it's uh, still 400 pages. It's uh, coming out good, coming out really good. I'm really, really liking it. So my piece is just going to be like a little sliver then because I wrote an, a true short story. I mm -hmm. got That's right. Yours Miracle. was the sh shortest one, I think. And, uh, Oh wow! In, in this particular anthology, I'm not I'm not ashamed of that because I think it was. Yeah. Uh, no, that's fine. <laughs> it, uh, it it I used as many words as a story needed, exactly. and that is always so how you should write a story. Me, me too, and I'm the one. Uh, I don't know about that one, Dave. <laughs> I got to read that one before I make that call. <laughs> yeah, I constantly have a chronic problem with my stories that I intend to be a short story turn into novels, and uh, so I'm intentionally exercising my short story um, muscles by uh, doing anthologies and stuff. Hmm. Ooh, this brandy is sweet. Anyone have Disserano? Yes, I have. I have a full-size bottle down on the bar. Is it always this sweet? Yes. And I very almondy. Was, yeah, very almondy. It goes down easy. Hmm. So with the, uh, I will impart one lesson learned from my story. Um, which is basically uh, something George R.R. R. Martin probably <laughs> could have taught us more effectively. But uh, there's a rule of thumb that says every time you add another point of view character to your story, you double the length of the story. Uh, and there's a, uh, 
they, they don't all have the same weight, but I, I have like six viewpoint characters. Um, wow. And it was supposed to be a novelette. Yeah. Six. Oh, six for a novelette. That's a, novelette. That's a lot. <laughs> now they don't, they don't all have the same weight as the main character, but uh, you know, so I won't say that each one doubled the society. No, no, no. But each had an impact on, on the overall length. Well, sometimes you got to get in the head of the baddie. What do you guys? Uh, what do you want for Christmas? What's the, what's on the list? What are you asking Santa for? Oh my! <laughs> well, I I actually I usually have a hard time making a list. Um, uh, but this year I decided I, I was going to play video games. I was going to try. I, I thought when I retired, my quit for my day job, I thought I'd be playing video games all the time. <laughs> I got this great monitor for video games. I, I should be playing video games. I'm the guy that should be playing video games. But I just haven't. And so I was talking to some friends about uh, video gaming and stuff. And now I want to get one of those Oculus rigs, you know, the 3D goggles. Oh. If, I, if I'm going to jump in, I might as well jump in with both feet. What kind of games are you looking at, like shooters or RPGs or what? Uh, both. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of really, really interesting games that you can uh, play. I like the, the games that have complex environment. They don't have to have necessarily be a first-person shooter but I like to explore. I also like puzzle games, like the old Myst games. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Which I, I found out they have been re-engineered for, you know, uh, VR goggles and stuff. Mm. Um, where, some where authors the, use, uh, use them to write. I'm not sure I'll be able to do that. Were yeah. the guitar lessons on your Christmas list, or was that just something you just did? No, it's just something I, I've been looking for um, a teacher, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah. And when once COVID hit, it was it's like, you know, yeah, too, yeah. How, how the hell? But um, since uh, the rise of Zoom, mm -hmm. um, it a lot of uh, um, music instructors have re-engineered their practices to wow. be able to do remote teaching and pricing it as such. Mm. So I found a guy; he's local, and um, you know, talking with him online and uh, showing him what. You know, I've got two really nice guitars. You know, both of them were gifts. And um, I had felt guilty them collecting dust. So I went and had my acoustic guitar restrung. And I found the guy. Right. And on, on Wednesday, I'm going to learn how to tune the thing. That's tomorrow. First, That's the first hardest lesson. part. It is tomorrow. Oh, All right, Erica, what's on your Christmas list? Yeah, I don't really have a Christmas list. I, yeah, if you're with, like, I want world peace, I want, yeah. <laughs> No, because usually if I, if I want something or need something, like, badly enough, I can just, I can get usually it. get it. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's like, so, I already have two of everything I ever wanted, so it's really hard for the Christmas. Oh, this sweater, what hmm. I got for Christmas last year. Nice. This is actually the sweater That's from the Big Lebowski. Um, nice, nice. It's the real Pendleton, yeah. you know, Westerly sweater, you know, really nice sweater. And yeah. my wife bought it from me for me for uh, you know, because I love the movie. Of course. And, um, this year I asked for the the same bathrobe he wore. <laughs> the Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> so, uh, oh, um, Jeffrey, this is as close as I get to uh, cosplay. <laughs> <laughs> Because I also have his pajama bottoms that he is famous for wearing in, the, in that mm -hmm. room. Mm -hmm. Anybody you want. Starting to worry about you. <laughs> it's a great movie. It's my favorite movie. Mm. I, I must confess I haven't seen it, which uh, I feel bad about. I haven't know. either. You I'm have. You have yes, I know, I know. You have a great joy ahead of you. Yeah, there so, you go. So, so now, I'm, now I'm suddenly jealous of you. <laughs> to get to see it for the first time. <laughs> you know, and, that, and that's funny, too, because I, I found some things in my life that uh, movies, let's say, that I, that I have loved so much that uh, you only ever get to see them for the first time, mm -hmm. obviously, once. And, uh, you know, uh, 
I'll never be able to watch Titanic again the same way I, 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 I saw it when I saw it in the theater for the first time. Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, it's kind of a strange, strange feeling. What do you want yeah, for totally Christmas, Dave? I'm, uh... I'm waiting. Hmm? What do you want for Christmas? What's on your list? Yeah, no, my problem is, yeah, it's the same, my wife and I were talking about this, you know, we, we're, we're old enough and we make enough money that pretty much if we want something, we, we buy it. Now, that might change if it's like, uh, if what you want is a new car or, or, a, or a Lamborghini or, you know, or something. But for the most part, we, we, if we want it, we, we buy it. And if it's large, then we just budget for it. Um, so I told her I wanted a whole bunch of wood from uh, Home Depot because I got a bunch of things I want to build around the house. I finished my basement. I've got little nooks and crannies I want to build some shelves in. Uh, and then I want to put up more decorative shelves in my, in my, uh, in a little niche in my office, some things like that. So it's basically handyman type stuff. Dave wants wood. All right. That's exciting. <laughs> how about you, Jeffrey? Be careful how you say that. Oh, I know how I said it, Dave. It was on purpose. All right. Well, for me, um, all right. A few months ago, I decided that because I run all of my, my meetups on Zoom, and many of them are writing meetups where I have to divide my screen between the document that we're reviewing and the uh, Zoom so I can see the people that we're doing. And then because I have the timer of those meetings, like timers in um, Toastmasters, I say, oh, I'm turning my green. Well, I can demonstrate. So I take my screen and I uh, change the background. I say, okay, you've got it. You've done it for enough time. All right. You've got about half the time left and all right, man, you got to pull out. Well, that dialogue that, that allows me to do that takes up a good third of my screen. So that in addition to the document, in addition to the Zoom meeting, it's like, oh, man, I need a new monitor. So I've been looking at monitors for this laptop and I found one that I really love. It's like a 49 inch curve around. It's huge. It's the one that Marty has. We talk about every week, right? It's not the the curve around you have yeah. The curve around? yeah yeah mine's a curve single, single curve around yeah so 49 inch well i um i looked at it and it was like 1500 people were telling it, it should be 25 uh, 50 uh, or yeah yeah 1250 and um and so i've been looking and looking and then the black friday came around and a friend of mine at work said you know check it out it's a good deal and it's like okay on tuesday it was available i could have gotten it but I was really, really busy on Tuesday. So I waited and waited. By Friday, it was gone. I sold out. Got to get it for the original 1500 price. So I did not get it. So if I could get that for Christmas, that would be so beautiful because I hate having to cram everything into my window. But believe me, it's not going to happen. And I'll just put a price watch on that. And if it ever goes down again, I'm going to buy it. Well, I will put a, I'll put a good word in, to, in for you to Santa because... As I told you guys last week on the podcast, I have put out a Wetters to Santa mailbox in my neighborhood. And in four days, I got 58 letters. Wow. And so I have been replying, and I have a stamp that is from the North Pole, so it looks very official. And I've had a couple of kids, you know, mention things like their favorite candy or whatever, and I'll put in that candy uh, into the letter. Or I've had a couple of kids, I've had a couple of kids being very self-aware which i admire they're like you know i've been good and bad this year or they're like you know i don't know if i've been good this year i hope so but you know i have been bad on a couple of occasions like just really uh i don't know it right, touched me one kid was like you know i might be on the naughty list but i if there's any way i can be on the nice list i really love trucks and Aww. so I, w I went and i bought him a small truck uh, that i'm going to put in his mailbox too so it's just been it's been more of a gift to me than to the kids i think but uh it is rapidly accumulating, Absolutely. so I'm hoping that my, my mm. professional writer skills can come in handy to, to get all these letters out to the kids. Oh. I refuse to take on help because I am Santa, and I'm very proud of it. So I'm so proud of you, Shay. So where did you put the box? I put the box, um, so I live on a bike path that gets a lot of traffic, actually, and I put the box down by the street at the bike path, so it's very neutral. Not in front of my house or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I had a padlock and I, I locked it to, a, you know, a big signpost. And, uh, and then the community center posted about it on their Facebook page or whatever. 
and it just took off. We had no no idea that they would respond that way. But people, I got you know, I got one person that drove from Fairfax. I live in Centerville. Wow. Drove from Fairfax to drop off a letter uh, to Santa. So it's it's been uh, quite amazing. That's great. Yeah. That's great. That's really great. I find that like this holiday season, I'm really, I'm a lot more into decorations and cheer and music than I normally am. I think because of the yeah. the strange times. So I think it's a really sweet thing that you're doing and yeah. spreading that. You got to yeah. find some joy in it, right? Even though it's different. For sure. Yeah. And you didn't tell us what you wanted for Christmas, Shay. Oh, okay. So I'm the one that World wants peace. World peace. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You guys are all very selfish. That's what I put on my list is world peace. Well, I want galactic peace, so. Oh, there you go. dang. She won up me. You can um, what is on my Christmas list? Um, well, speaking of like home preparation, I saw a commercial for Battery Daddy, and that just blew my socks off. That was like, it's like this huge big case with all types of double A, triple A, D, C. It's like you're shopping in a bra store. It's just got all these different, you know types and so that that kind of stole my attention so maybe i'll get a battery daddy and uh, and you guys can all come to my house for uh armageddon for preparedness <laughs> yeah well one of the key points about being prepared for armageddon is you don't tell anybody you're prepared for armageddon I, yeah. yeah i, I just noticed how that, i yeah. was silent before i oh, didn't tell you guys my plan <laughs> exactly i may or may not survive it's none of your business whether i survive or not Yes, she acts like she's shy, but really, she's planning on taking. Don't all come knocking on our door. Yeah, she and, and she's planning on taking all of Marty's stuff when the Armageddon drops. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I read. I read another book. I wish I could remember the authors. Um, when somebody mentioned Mormons, um, this guy he was a real asshole, and he had joined the Mormon Church. Uh, not because of faith. He just wanted to know where all the Mormons lived. So after Armageddon, he could go there and take all their shit. That's so oh, random. Wow. <laughs> it made you know, for Mormons... a plot for a book. And, you know, a, really, a guy that really earned his come But up. Marty, that, that has a huge plot hole because Mormons are nice enough that they will tell you where they live, whether you're in their church or not. They will welcome you into their home either way. I'm just telling you what I read. And, uh, That's true. You know, they made a big deal about him stealing the church directory. And, uh, oh, wow. Oh. It, you know, it was a good story, you know. I'm sure it'll never get made in the movie because it gave too many assholes ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did get a, um, I mentioned my aquarium when we were talking about the power going out. Going out. I just installed a saltwater aquarium. Wow. It has no fish in it yet. So maybe that will also be on my Christmas list as a couple of friends. To join the aquarium but i can't decide if i want a reef aquarium or a shark aquarium because you can't have both like you can either have like stingrays and sharks or like clownfish and like dory from finding nemo so i can't decide what, what, what let's talk about it let's let's decide together i had i had a saltwater tank growing up because okay. i was really into seahorses for a while as a kid like yeah. We, so we got seahorses and we had a couple of seahorses, but you had to feed them live brine shrimp. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to like go to the pet store regularly to get them brine shrimp. But could um, they, could the seahorses cohabitate with anything? Like what else did you have? Or yeah, you I think it? there were some fish in there, but I, I clearly didn't love the fish as much as the seahorses. Um, I think we had an anemone once too. My really? brother had a saltwater tank and he had some really beautiful fish. I don't know what kind. Yeah, um, we had a we had a fish tank, and we only had goldfish because they were impossible <laughs> right. to kill. <laughs> yeah. One thing, one thing that I didn't know, I guess, as a kid, is that you you got to be careful, like where you're getting the stuff from, because some of it is not collected in a like yeah. in an ethical way. Right. So right. I don't know about those seahorses now, but as a kid, I had no idea. They're and I haunting thought, you now. Cool. Yeah, now that I think about it. I no, I've looked at, I, I was interested in seahorses too. I looked at them as an option, but I read that like they can't be with a lot of different, I don't know, I guess they're very like, they're, they don't fend for themselves and people, things will eat them or, yeah, I don't know. So mm -hmm. you have to be very careful with seahorses or something. Yeah. It was hard to keep it alive. Yeah. You know, I had, I, I knew a friend a long time ago when I'm like spent a hundred dollars on a new fish. 
you know, got yes. it temperature, you know, equalized. And then when he dumped the fish in the tank, two seconds later, one of the other fish ate it. Oh, yeah. That's, so, that's watch the compatibility. The that's hardest, tragic. The hardest thing, though, is um, what you'll find is saltwater tanks really hard to maintain. It's hard to find out how to dispose when you clean out the tank of that water. But hey, good I, luck. I know you can do it. Yeah, no, I, it's been complicated. I had to get like this salinity thing and I, I got a filter going. It looks very good though. But I just, yeah, I don't know what kind of family I'm going to have. I was even looking at jellyfish, but apparently mm. that's like the opposite of what you need for jellyfish. Jellyfish need like a, a spherical tank because otherwise they get sucked in by the filter or oh, something yeah. like that. So yeah, one of the best fish. tips I got, we had a we had a, an aquarium for many years. Yeah. Was, we got it for free. A friend gave us a 55 gallon aquarium. It was this ginormous thing. It was huge. It was like a giant wall. And um, it was only 12 inches deep, but the face of it was probably six feet long by wow. you know four feet high. Wow. And um, it was 55 gallons. And um, the best advice I got was um, a friend told me who has had a lot of aquariums said, you got a 55 gallon tank, get a filter for a 110 gallon tank. Yes. Smart. Amen. That's what I got. I have a... I, it was great. He said, all you got to do is just watch the level of water and keep topping it off. And, um, yes. and he I have me a... the kinds of fish to get because we just had goldfish. Uh, that's I have a 65 gallon. Outside in a fish pond that we had. And uh, Brenda felt guilty, so she got this original aquarium to bring the fish in for the winter. Oh, <laughs> that's a little pond we had them in in our garden um, would freeze solid every mm -hmm. winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, I have a 65 gallon, one. and I got a filter for a hundred gallon. Smart, smart, yeah. nice. And yeah, my brother used to keep fish. He had a uh, well, it must have been about 55 gallon tank. In his old house, when he moved, he got rid of the fish. Unfortunately, still has his his a uh, conure, lovely bird, been alive for something like twenty years. Hmm. It can speak a bit. It can say my name. Uh, I'm kind of fascinated by the idea of large fish tanks, but at the same time, I don't want the maintenance that comes with one. Hmm. Um, when I first moved into this area, uh, this is Northern Virginia, uh, there was a fish tank store in the Fair Oaks Mall. Yeah, I remember that. It was custom fish tanks. And I used to love to go in there because they had the most magnificent um, uh, fish tanks. I mean, one of the doors that you walked through to get into the store, you were walking through a fish tank, which was both walls and the ceiling above you. And you're walking through the middle of a fish tank to get in. Um, so they were, they were the kind of place that uh, if you were rich, had a large house and wanted to turn an entire uh, wall of your living room into a saltwater fish tank they could do it and it was and they had beautiful coral reef constructions and beautiful fish and stuff and all i could think of was the, the cost the maintenance mm -hmm. uh, i'd love to see it in place at somebody's house but just not in mine yeah yeah it was a lot of work we kept ours until the last fish died and uh um that we you know, gave the whole the whole rig away. It's uh, probably still bubbling away in someone else's basement. Yeah, I keep you posted. I keep you posted. I had turtles growing up. Yeah, we need to see pictures. What did you say? Mm -hmm. Pictures. pictures. Oh, yeah. Some pictures. Yeah, I will send pictures. Absolutely. When I decide what to get, I, I definitely need one of those. Um, custom coral or whatever because my, my tank is not wide it's tall it's an oct uh -huh. oxy what do you call it uh, octagon uh -huh. or hexagon something you know shape and so <laughs> it's it needs coral that's going to be like a tower just like going up and not like spreading out i have no idea where to get it so we will see and that's one of the things that that fish tank store did they yeah they also had fish tanks that could be like a pillar in your house mm -hmm. nice yeah i remember yeah. that you could you could get like round ones just yep. like a cylinder that was like eight feet tall that you could install in your house yeah, yeah. i mean it was fascinating it's just you know I, I never even asked about the cost i was i was young and poor anyway okay speaking of that do you guys have what i have which is like 
store browsing guilt where you go into a store all the time because you think it's really pretty, but you never buy anything. And you just, you feel like you know that the, the owners or whatever, the shopkeepers like know who you are and that you never buy anything. That's how I feel about the, the, the fish tank store in Centerville, except now I'm actually buying things. But I would go in there for years and just like look and maybe ask a couple questions, which is always the most annoying thing. Like when you ask questions, if you're about to buy something. Anyone else have a store like that? Like what is your store? Yeah, identify it. Tell me what store it is. So I think you just def defined a good metaphor for being a writer. Yeah. Uh, the thing about marketing is um, the, the rule of thumb is that somebody has to be touched at least seven times by something that they might potentially be interested in before they say, you know, I'd really like to try that. You mean like, oh, oh like uh, someone has to see an ad for it seven times? Yeah. Or, or huh. it, it could be somebody saw an ad for your book. Uh, another friend was reading it uh, and mentioned that they liked it. You mm -hmm. saw somebody reading it on the Metro. In other words, seven touches of some kind. And they're like, huh, maybe I should try out that book. It looks like everybody's reading The Martian, right? Uh, would be a good example of, of word of mouth. Um, so you might think that uh, you were just going in the store and nothing was happening. But uh, over time, you eventually bought a fish tank at that store. That's true. So all the time that they let you browse. Yeah. Except I didn't buy the fish tank at that store. I bought it secondhand for 40 bucks. So this is, this is a tragedy. To answer you, your question, I don't think, you know, store owners, you know, mind you coming in and browsing. Um, they're just glad people are coming in at this true. point. It's, it's true. Uh, yeah. and, and you know, also, so I never feel guilty. Um, you know, there's a lot of stores I go in. I always, you know... Like, my wife is hilarious. She knows me. She knows every time I walk into Best Buy, I go and cruise all the TVs. I, I like, have my route. I cruise yeah. all the TVs, and then I go look at all the DVDs. And um, and she always knows where to find them. Gosh, I miss, I miss not having to decide between just going out to a store I love and, like, maybe dying. Like, I miss that, not having that choice. Right, <laughs> right, right. right. Yeah. Hey, you know, I, I'm curious though. Uh, so we've talked about dogs. We've talked about cats. We've talked about uh, fish. I mentioned birds briefly. Any other pets that are interesting? Like my brother used to own a, uh, a blue tongue skink. That guy was a little guy and he was so fun in his little terrarium waddling around and everything. It's pretty sad when we lost him because of course, like many animals, he crawled out of his net, his terrarium and hid and all that, but uh, he was really fun when he was he was with us. I've and known people with odd pets, you know, snakes and iguanas and stuff like that. I've never had a pet like that. Turtles. I have a friend with a turtle. I, I've had turtles. We fed them goldfish. <laughs> I have um, a friend who has had the same turtle for 35 years. Oh, wow. I... This, this wasn't a pet, but this summer, and again, I think it's like being in my house all the time that made me do this. There was like a little baby bunny that would go to our little garden in our backyard. And at first I would just sort of like yell at it and shoo it away. And then like, I didn't see it for a week and I was so concerned. Um, and it was alive and it came back and it brought a friend. Uh, and then we just spent the summer sort of just like watching these two bunnies hang out in our front yard in our backyard like eating our grass and fortunately not our like vegetables but right. i don't think that really counts as a a pet or even a weird pet because rabbits are normal that just brought up a lot of a lot of <laughs> guilt actually because i just had rabbit stew for the first time um, last week and it was delicious but i had so much guilt after because they're just so fluffy and cute and i just i don't know i don't know if i can do it again but it was amazing I, I brought it. this up solely to make you feel bad, Shay. I know you did. I know you did. And I deserve it. And I accept it. It's a tough crowd. I well, you didn't, eat, you didn't eat our rabbits, so it's fine. I didn't eat your rabbit, I promise. I love rabbits, too. It um, felt very hobbit -y. I felt like I was, like, in The Hobbit. I love squirrels, too. You ever have squirrel? Squirrels squirrel? Too, okay, too. I wouldn't mind that. That's kind of, like, I don't know. It's just a different vibe. After what squirrels did to my attic, I have no problem. <laughs> Not at all. They it's really funny. I, I I almost feel like the squirrels in my yard 
are pets because I have bird feeders that are right outside the, my uh, den window to primarily amuse my cat because it's the only way I can keep the cat away from my keyboard while I'm trying to get some work done. <laughs> so I got these bird feeders out there, but in addition to bringing a lot of birds in, they kicked a lot of the seed out and it really intrigues the squirrels. And I have these epic battles with the squirrels and the raccoons trying to keep them out of the bird feeders. It's kind of fun. Hmm. Um, so I played Magic the Gathering for the first time in my life mm. last week as well. And I don't know, I feel like it's just one thing that I've seen in in this place we call Earth for years and years. It's like out and about. And I've always been that person that's like, that's too complicated. I'm never going to know how to play that game. Like, mm. I'm never going to even try. And it, it was a little complicated. But once I got into it, I just accessed this deep nerd inside of me that I didn't know was there. And I got to know, I got to know that person. And I'm just, I'm very, very grateful that I won this game. I'm going to make, make my own deck and do the thing now. I'm excited about it. Have you guys played Magic the Gathering? That's my question. I have. And it's a combination game and addiction. Do you like it? Collecting those cards can be an obsession. You like um, it though? Like it was. Oh yeah. I liked it. I liked playing it back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. I enjoyed but it I, you know, I gave my kids all my cards and stuff, and they, I don't know where they're gone. I don't know what happened to them. I feel um, like if you make a promise to yourself that you're not going to purchase a card that's more than a dollar, then you're okay. But I feel like those promises are always broken. Yeah. It's a long, slippery slope. And at the end lies a huge time sink keeping you from your writing. That uh, is right. That's true. Or, or, or inspiring you to write. Remember my talk about video games and how and my mom was always like that waste of waste of time and all that. And that's why it's such a you slippery slope. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm teasing you. True. Hey, I mean, I, I, a lot of the stuff I do, like I spend a lot of time reading books about science just so I can be a better science fiction writer. I mean, there are ways to uh, progress. Although I don't know how to justify all the time I spend on BGA and Yucata playing board games with my friends uh, on the Friday night. Uh, games night but uh you know hey you never know i learn at least uh from uh taxis and taxis all the nice towns that i've been in germany and switzerland and uh and uh e e and uh, what's it called uh eastern france there you go jeffrey do you have any like rare books like rare science books uh i don't think so i mean i'll be honest most of my books i've got in my audible catalog something around 400 to 500 books and only about half of them I've listened to. I've got a lot of listening ahead of me. <laughs> That's one thing that I want to, I'm already like thinking about stuff for next year. And that reminds me of one of the things I want to do. Like I want to go through my sort of like audiobook backlog and my um, Kindle ebook backlog and sort of look at the ones that I, like I, clicked on because they were in those free emails like BookBub or Book Barbarian or whatever it is and sort of weed out and look at ones that I want to try reading this year and make a list because some of them I it's been so long I forgot it happened uh, earlier this week or maybe it was last week I clicked on one one of the emails I'm like oh that sounds interesting and it's like you purchased this title in 2017 and I'm like oh <laughs> I definitely didn't read it <laughs> maybe I should <laughs> Yeah, well, at least Audible keeps track of what I've listened to, except for the early ones where I didn't actually listen to them in Audible. I downloaded them and listened to them in some other platform. Well, I, I think that's it, it gets interesting because I, I feel like, you know, so many people have bought or or received for free so many ebooks or audiobooks or stuff like that um, that you're now at the point where you sort of need to have the the features for managing your collection and mm -hmm. going. This is the stuff that I want to, to think about reading again because I really liked it. And mm. this is the stuff I'll never read. And this is the stuff I read once, but now purge it from my list because I'll never read it again. Stuff like that. Mm. All do the you things guys have a, library. Do you guys have a hard time like letting go of books, like donating or hey, I'm never letting my uh, Doctor Who uh, novelizations go. Those things are precious to me. No, there's I'm some trying. books, there's some books I'll never let go of. And uh, other books, 
I'll read them once and I'm hap happy to take them in the case to trade them in. Um, yeah. It depends on the book. Erica? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the same way as Marty. I'm trying to collect uh, as many of like the Stargate novels as I can because I just want them to, to be around me, which is, I guess, weird. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's some books where I don't care and I'll, I'll take them back. Uh, mm. But some you, you kind of want to hang on to. I have, I have self-diagnosed as having like, not like severe, but like mild symptoms of hoarding, like in my life. Um, and I, and I, I'll confess, like it used to be really bad. Like when I was in elementary school, I couldn't throw away like uh, an empty milk carton. It was, it was like severe in that, at that stage, but I was able to self-correct a little bit. So I'm not that bad anymore, but I did just get rid of like three big bags of books from my super overstuffed library. And I still have like, you know, those like emotions of like, are, do the, are the books sad or do the books feel like I rejected them? Like, are the books shivering right now and thinking, why wasn't I good enough? Like, I have this weird object personification kind of syndrome going on here that I think a lot of, uh, a lot of closet hoarders might have as well, where you think that, you know, objects feel bad when you give them away or reject them or whatever. So I, I'm trying mm -hmm. to get over that. If you have any advice, let me know. It, I think it makes me a very good person. I'm very empathetic, even to inanimate objects. There you go. I had, I had this game that I played um, when I was uh, when I was younger. Um, there was a bunch of used bookstores in, in Delaware where I grew up. And uh, when I traded books in, um, before I traded them in, I would draw a red line under the under uh, the page number for page twenty five, and then I would send those books back to the used bookstores. And then I, I was just curious, you know, years down the line, if I would see any of those books again, would I see it at the Bookateria? Uh, would I see it somewhere else? Would I see it in Virginia when I moved to Virginia, if the, if the book was bought and traveled and stuff? And it was just sort of a, a game. Yeah. I don't think I ever saw them outside of, of Delaware, but, uh, and, I, and I stopped doing that when I got to be in my 20s, but that, that was something I did with the books. It's like, yes, I traded them in, but they, were, they still had the keener mark. Yeah, I like really that. like that. Maybe I'll do that. Here's a yeah. story that happened this week. I uh, have been um, reading some of the old books that I loved that I read many years ago. And there is a series that's uh, called the Time War series by oh, yeah. Simon Hawk, right? So I decided I wanted to collect all these editions again. Um, so uh, I was haunting McKay's, you know, there's like 12 different books in the series and I was finding them periodically and I only had two left that I needed to get. So I started haunting eBay uh, for, for the titles. And so before I got this one, I ordered one and I got this. Somebody took one of the books and scanned it. Oh. These are scanned pages. You can actually even, let me find one. Um, I bet you Simon Hawk's yeah, not getting any money from that. Sometimes at the top of the page, I don't know if you can see that, you can even see the <laughs> top of the page. All right. How, how it was scanned. So the yeah. they actually scanned the entire book. They use some crappy copyright free art and as as you know it's even got a 9000 uh number on the uh, huh. pc label wow and they just published it via um amazon and i don't know if it's simon hawk or not i i would bet you that it isn't and, and even if it was simon hawk if the publisher knew <laughs> They'd be like, you know, you can oh, format yeah. your own friggin' books. <clears throat> yeah. And Marty, what was the title of that book again? Well, the Not series is Time Wars. Right, but the the last, the, the one, the second one, the, the red book. That's the, the same making... title as this. Oh, really? Oh, that is, is paper, yeah. the same book as this. Oh, right, right. So it is just that that's been hacked and, and wow. Well, There's kind of a lesson learned there, too, in, in that... Um, uh, intellectual property has value, and uh, I don't even know if Simon Hawk is still alive. There's no copyright page. Wow. I was going to ask about yeah. if there was one. Nope. Um, but uh, yeah, copyright lasts the lifetime of the author plus 70 years. Yeah. Oh, wait. It does. 
It does have that. 2016 Simon Hawk. Huh. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. that looks kind of lame to me. I have my doubts that that's actually Simon Hawk. Yeah, me too. So, so, so I think there's that's, a, that's, a, that's a really weird one. So I feel robbed for this. I, I was willing to pay $7.95 for, you know, for the original mass market paperback. And that's what I got right, huh. just right here. Yeah. And, uh, with a glossy cover that you can't even read on Zoom. So I feel like that's, that's an example of a squatter. Um, so there's, there's an IP that's probably been abandoned by the author. It's out of print. And somebody has just decided to make money off of it. And, uh, you know, if, the, if nobody's stopping him and Simon Hawk isn't around to say this is bad and the publisher doesn't care about something that was published 30 years ago, um, you know, there, somebody's making money off of the IP and it's not the original writer. Yeah. Yeah, this was an, um, published by Ace in 1988. Mm -hmm. And it's frightening it's about that time me frame. to think how long ago 1988 was now. Right. And, and Ace has been bought several times and who knows which conglomerate it belongs to now. So there's nobody paying attention to whether rights that they own for Simon Hawk from 32 years ago are being misused by somebody. Right. Mind yeah. you, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that... Uh, I remember when uh, I think it was Confessor from the Terry Goodkind series, uh, The Sort of Truth, that I actually saw online uh, in one of these nefarious uh, publishers. And Terry Goodkind was alive. He just published that book. I mean, it's it's amazing how fast, you know, legitimate books get into the uh, piracy. Yeah, all, all of my novels have been pirated. It's... Uh, um, you know, it really pissed me off in the beginning, it, you know, because, but there's nothing, there's no recourse. Yeah. You know, I uh, brought my lawyer in on it, you know, and all of that. And there's just like nothing you can do if it's mm. being sold on a website in mainland China who are mm. awful yeah. about copyright and, you know, IP and stuff. Particularly the audio editions. That's the one that really pissed oh, me off. Because really, yeah. yeah. it's so easy to pirate, so easy to, um, steal. Um, yeah. The weird Something. thing was is the producer that I had for my audiobooks. Uh, you know, I thought I could get a little bit more momentum behind you know going after these guys by bringing the producer in because it's costing him money too. These particular audiobooks, I did a royalty share agreement with the producer, and you know, so I called him up and told him, and he goes, "Woohoo!" It's like what's wrong with you man he goes they don't pirate books that suck <laughs> so, uh, you know his was it was an endorsement that uh they thought that my book was good enough to be able to uh generate revenues for them so right a goal to strive for I, I, I also... another another point that he made was is that people that that download pirated books don't buy ever buy books yeah, so, that's true. So it's not a, it's not a customer you're losing because, you know, these guys they don't they don't ever buy anything. So well, it, it's like they say, some people just like to read books in the piracy of their own home. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist. <laughs> so, you know, some people think it's like a library. You know. Yeah. Go figure. Oh well. So, we, did any of you guys talk to Stephanie this week, why she's not here? Oh, yeah. Well, poor thing. I mean, her and now it sounds like her her uh, child also has COVID. Yeah, COVID. Last it. week on the podcast, she was like, oh, I got this cold. Mm -hmm. Drive me crazy. Sorry, guys. My nose is running. And it turns out she's got COVID. Yeah. Uh, although she's on the men already. She, yeah. Uh, oh, she's yeah. feeling better just in time for her husband to start not feeling good. And yeah, our thoughts are with her. Little it, kids, so she's uh, yeah about them too. Our thoughts are definitely with her. It, it's scary because like yeah. I feel like every every single symptom that your body can have is possibly a symptom of COVID. Yeah, like literally everything. You know, a headache. It could be COVID. Like you just mm -hmm. never know. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's scary. Yeah. Weird stuff. It's, oh, uh, strange days, man. Strange days. Stock up, get those, get the Mormon church 
supplying <laughs> yeah. it. Come on. Yes. I, I think the Mormon Church right? addresses, did you say? That, no. <laughs> I, I just want to say, any time travelers watching this podcast in the future, avoid 2020 uh, if you can. <laughs> like the plague, quite literally. <laughs> Have you guys been tracking this monolith that's been disappearing and reappearing? Yeah. That is the most overreported story mm. in well, the world. Did you, the, did you see the TikTok today? No. Oh. These, these guys put a TikTok on there, and the whole TikTok, you know, they're only really short videos. Yeah. One of them arriving at the site and complaining because they drove 16 hours to get there and the monolith was gone. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, the weird thing was somebody else noticed on Reddit that in the background, in one of the crevices, it looks like a monster. You see, like fingers <laughs> going like this around the side of the crevice, and you see eyes and shit. It's really oh, wet, wow. really oh, wet. Hey. Now we've so, got some stories. <laughs> yeah, you can hunt that down. It's a really, uh, I like seeing this. Thing of snowball. It's really great. Now it's just, disappeared in Romania. I understand. Mm. I hate yeah. how whenever you find a good thing, the government's got to come and just like take it down for some reason. Oh, Why can't yeah. they just leave it up? Just leave it up. We all are fascinated. It was the aliens. It, maybe the aliens did it. Uh, did you read the Sentinel by Arthur C. Clarke? I think I think y'all have not gone outside in here. I was about to complain that I haven't left the house in like ten months, except for like three times. Okay, guys. <laughs> I want to go and erect a monolith somewhere. That's what I want to do. Yes, I'll do it with you. You know that I was the uh, I was the tour guide at Bonehenge, which is Cox Farms' version of Stonehenge. Oh yes. wow! A life size a life size replica of Stonehenge made out of foam, spray painted gray, and Cox Farms is like our local, you know, family run farm, and they throw a festival every autumn. And I was hired as a historian to give people facts nice. and talk about Stonehenge. So yeah, Marty, I mean, if you need an expert to help you erect a monolith, I I'm there for you. You know, yeah. I have, um, on a road trip a couple of years ago that Brendan and I took, we uh, um, uh, went to what is basically known as the Stonehenge of America. Mm -hmm. There is a... Um, a uh, mystery monument that's in Georgia that um, um, has um, written in like 12 different languages or something, um, basically basic survival instructions on how mankind will rebuild after the uh, Great Fall. It's very interesting. When is the Great Fall? I don't know, it doesn't say that. I mean, does it? Do you know when uh, when they considered it being written? I mean, is it um, in English? <laughs> when it was built, you mean? Yeah, I guess. Oh, it was built like in the, I don't know, twenties or thirties. Okay. Or okay. something like that. It was. I can't remember. I could probably look it up. Um, Brenda really got into researching all that stuff, but it's, you know, it's a really impressive structure. You know, it's made out of granite. It, it will last millennia like Stonehenge and it's got all these really interesting uh holes bored through the thing that you know the whole thing is like a sundial that you know on the summer and autumn equinox and on the solstices and everything a specific thing cool. happens and well, I mean I do have friends over there in Salisbury the UK and and uh you know I have a standing uh you know invitation to visit and see from I don't know, 50 meters away, uh, the real Stonehenge, one of these days, maybe. Jeffrey, Jeffrey breaking out the accent again. Jeffrey, can you just do the whole episode in the accent? That's what I would like. <laughs> our, our, our viewership would just skyrocket if we just had someone with an accent. I think you should do Hello, it. Welcome to an episode of the Owlings. <laughs> I'm your host, Jeffrey C. Jacobs, and I'd like to introduce you to my friends, Marty, Shay, David, and of course, Erica. Flawless. Flawless. Well done. <laughs> I can't do accents. I just embarrass. Uh, I just embarrass myself every time I try to do an accent. You do the American accent very well, actually. <laughs> oh yes. 
I, I actually, uh, when I was in the UK, I mean, uh, I went around. You see, when I'm in the UK, I, I totally, I do RP. I do um, um, the, the pronunciation. Uh, and um, they, they don't know. They say, no, I don't know. I'm, you're from the UK. I just don't know where. And, and they're like, okay. And then someone outs me and says, no, he's American. <laughs> <laughs> ah, buddy, hell. Well, you guys, it's been a really interesting uh, session. It went a lot of places yeah. that I never thought we'd be talking about exactly. how to survive the apocalypse. Good tips. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, uh, so any last words from anybody before we uh, uh, shut this baby down? I think we'll be back to more structured literary topics, I trust. Yeah, and, I think uh, next we'll week we'll pick a specific topic. Um, and uh, we'll work that again, like, you know, like yeah. we have been. But it was fun. I think that we need yeah. to to have happy hour like once a month or so. Happy hour wings. Yep, I love it. That's well, right. Yeah. Happy I'll, hour I'll, wings. I'll drink to that. Episode eight is going to be around the holidays. Perfect Cheers. time yeah. to have a happy so, hour. Uh, um, that's good. Any final words from anybody? Hydrogen hydroxide, guys. It's life-giving, and it can also kill you. Like everything. <laughs> Moderation in all things except love and justice. Yep. And I'm that'll be our final word. All right. <laughs> so, everybody, we'll see you next week.